Massive thank you to uh, to Rob and uh, and of course for Kaiser for co-hosting tonight. Um, so for those of you that, that don't know me, my name is Barry Cranford. Uh, I'm the founder of the London Java community uh, and I run RecWorks, which is a tech recruitment company. Um, so here at RecWorks, we, we try to find ways that recruitment can be a force for good in the tech industry uh, beyond just getting people jobs. And that's specifically around career development, mentoring, learning, and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, it all came about when I was uh, doing my job as a recruiter and spending all day, every day, calling Java developers that were in London, uh, and to which 99% of them weren't looking for work. I'm sure you've all had these calls. And mm. thinking, I wonder if I could do something more with my time um, in between that, you know, and, and help these people that, that I was speaking to. Um, so, so that idea of, of whether we could bring people together uh, became the LJC. Um, and here we are, what, 13 years, 7,000 members and 500 odd events later. Um, so for the last 12 years, this space is what we've been experimenting in, trying all these different ways that we can think of to, to put people together. So we've got like a mentor introduction community. Um, like I say, we've run, run quite a number of events here and, and we've, we've launched a few new initiatives around bringing people together that are on this, um, on like a similar learning path. Uh, so we've got uh, groups around aspiring speakers, aspiring CTOs, that sort of thing. Um, it's all powered by recruitment. So we don't make any money from anything that we, we do other than getting people jobs. Um, so obviously we make money from getting people jobs and a percentage of that goes back into business. So if anyone out there is interested in hiring or, or looking for a role, then do bear us in mind. Anyway, on to, on to tonight. Uh, we're joined with, uh, with Rob Barr. Uh, so Rob has been a Java developer for the last 20 years now, uh, working in financial services uh, with a focus on high performing systems. Uh, he's passionate about building communities, actually founder of the, uh, the Docklands LJC, uh, as well as leveraging modern technologies. Uh, so he coaches teams to adopt proven agile, lean and DevOps method methodologies, uh, which deliver value to the enterprise. And he's going to be speaking to you tonight on Kubernetes for Java developers. So Rob. Thank you, Barry. Uh, okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. Uh, thanks, Barry, for that fantastic introduction. Um, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Uh, so Barry uh, gave a quick introduction about me. Uh, so yes, I have been a Java developer and I've been running Java engineering teams since Java 1.1.7, 1.17b, in fact. Uh, so if, if you've been around as long as me, you'll know this is like back in the day about shortly after the Java was actually conceived uh, and came into use. Uh, so I've, I've seen all the ups and downs. I've seen the numerous uh, incarnations of the date API. And I can say in Java 8, it is finally working, which is fantastic. Uh, so my most recent role was I was the engineering lead for the DevOps and Development Practices Group uh, at a large financial services firm. Um, this is the, the team that looks at what does DevOps mean? Um, for the company, how do we measure it? How do we get more of it? And how do we uh, get people to adopt it uh, and drive best practices across the organization? Uh, prior to that, I was head of development and data grid for the infrastructure engineering group at another large financial services organization. Uh, and around about this time, I helped co-found the Docklands London Java community. So this was uh, back in 2014, 2015, uh, and I ran a few events for them. Um, until about November 2018. I can say this has been a fantastic experience for me. <clears throat> you know, I've, <clears throat> um, I've always had a, a bit of a fear of public speaking. You know, so when I had the opportunity to join the Docklands London Java community as, uh, as one of the founding members, I thought this would be a perfect opportunity for me to get involved, um, help me work through that, that kind of fear of public speaking, of, of getting up in front of people and, and opening my mouth and talking. And I found this really helps, right? So the kind of the, the two uh, piece of advice I can give to people, if you want to get into public speaking, and there are lots of benefits for this, but the two pieces of advice I can give is number one, breathe, uh, because I found that um, a lot of people, the, the adrenaline starts to flow, you start to, uh, to rush your words, you forget to breathe. And just taking a, a pause and a break uh, really helps you with the flow. Uh, the second thing is that practice makes perfect. You know, so the more you do this, the easier it gets. Uh, the more confidence you have, the the better the speaker you become. Okay, so that's about me. Uh, 
so the disclaimer for today. <laughs> so um, I've had the luxury of having a little bit of downtime between jobs. Um, so I've challenged myself to take a look at you know, some of the areas I'm not as familiar with as I want to be. Uh, so starting with Kubernetes. You know, so Kubernetes, uh, I've used OpenShift, which is Red Hat's flavor of Kubernetes uh, in production for a number of years. Uh, but working in financial services, there's a lot of restrictions, at least in the companies I work with, around what you're allowed to do and how it works and how it works under the covers. Um, so I thought this is a really good opportunity for me to get to know a bit more about how Kubernetes works at the lower level. So what are the concepts? How can I apply it as a Java developer? So the disclaimer here is that I'm by no means a Kubernetes expert. Um, I have spent the last few weeks doing multiple tutorials, getting Kubernetes up and running, uh, thinking about how I've done this in the past with, uh, with tools like OpenShift. Um, I've also put together a, a sample application uh, that we'll take a look at. Uh, so really, this talk is kind of aimed at people who are starting to work with Kubernetes, who are interested within Kubernetes. If you have been working with Kubernetes for the last uh, few years, then hopefully there's little nuggets in here, but I think you're probably a, a little more advanced than the target audience for this. So uh, with that in mind, so we're going to talk about, uh, this is the rough agenda. So we're going to talk about Quarkus, Micronaut, and Spring Boot, and how it applies to the modern microservices world. We'll take a quick look at Docker. I'm sure everyone is familiar with Docker, but we'll have a quick recap in, into Docker and where Docker is these days. We'll look at the, the motivation behind Kubernetes. So we have Docker, why do we need Kubernetes? Uh, from there, we'll drill into the Kubernetes architecture. We'll take a look at some of the concepts. We'll look at how we can get Kubernetes up and running locally. So you know, Kubernetes is fantastic and running in the cloud. It's supported by all the major cloud vendors. But what happens when you want to develop Kubernetes locally? What are the options? Uh, we'll look at some related Kubernetes concepts. Uh, so things like Helm, uh, Istio, uh, a few bits and pieces like that. And then we'll talk about deployment pipelines. So how do we get code from our desktop machine, our work our development machine into production um, using some of the tools that we have. Uh, in terms of questions, uh, we have Kaiser is the co-host for tonight. So feel free to drop uh, some questions uh, in the channel. Uh, and I will try to pick them up at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> okay, uh, so as part of my preparation for this talk, uh, I put together a sample application. So this is a very basic Spring Boot application. It has one risk controller uh, that maps to the hello uh, endpoint URL. And when you hit that uh, with curl or with a browser, it returns hi mum. So this is pretty much as basic as it gets. Um, if you take a look at my GitHub repo over there for k8s4j.git, uh, you can take a look at this very basic application uh, and then play along at home. Uh, so we'll take a look at uh, the Docker file. We'll take a look at some of the configuration files here. But if you want to get into, into more details and get a, you know, a running application um, that walks through the concept that we're looking at here, then take a look at this repo. Okay, so Quarkus versus Micronaut versus Spring Boot. Uh, so the application that uh, I've been developing is Spring Boot. Uh, everyone these days uses Spring Boot. It is basically the de facto if you're doing a, uh, a Java application. Uh, so as everyone knows, it's an open source framework. Uh, it's been around for the last few years. It makes it really easy to create standalone production grade applications. And it comes with embedded Jetty uh, or Tomcat or Undertow. Um, it uses, if you use the spring initializer, then you can select which, um, which libraries and which uh, modules to include in your application. Um, it makes it really easy to wire things together and get an application up and running in little to no time. Um, the problem though with, uh, well, maybe historically the problem with spring and spring boot is that uh, Java in the past has been kind of aimed maybe historically again, uh, at long running applications. And so the Java start time hasn't been particularly good, but uh, if you're running Java, then you get the, the right once run anywhere guarantees. Uh, and you can be pretty sure that your Java application will run in a stable manner. Um, but in today's modern microservices world where you have multiple transient uh, microservices running, which are controlled by your, your container orchestrator, 
what you're really looking for is you want quick startup times. Um, you don't know how long your application is going to be running for. Uh, so Spring and Spring Boot, at least in the, the older versions, um, may not be what you're looking for. So there are a few, uh, uh, a few ideas out there about how we can start to address this. So the first one is Quarkus. So Quarkus builds itself as the supersonic subatomic Java, which I think is a, a great tagline. Uh, so it's a Kubernetes native Java stack designed for the OpenJDK hotspot uh, and Graal VM and includes the best Java libraries and standards. Uh, and really it's aimed at the speedy startup time. So it uses, um, can compile down to native Graal VM images uh, to produce applications which are supersonic in the sense that uh, the time to the first request or startup if you're running serverless or uh, is a lot, is, is really fast. And subatomic in the sense that your natively compiled application is smaller than your Java bytecode application. Um, so if you take a look at the, the Quarkus uh, homepage, they have some metrics. So they say they've taken a JDK application, just a simple CRUD application, and that's running in, st in standard Java mode, uses 145 megs of RAM. But if you run that in a native mode, so compile down to Graal VM native, uh, this uses 28 megs of RAM, which is approximately an 80% decrease. Uh, the same application uh, startup time was 2.03 seconds, uh, but in native mode, this was down to 0 0.042 seconds. So that's about a 98% decrease. So if you're looking for uh, a way to really compress your, your memory footprint and to speed up your startup time, then Quarkus is a, a really good uh, option there. Uh, Micronaut is a is similar. It's a build itself as a cloud native JVM based polyglot full stack framework. Uh, so it's not just Java, but you can also run any other JVM language, including things like a Kotlin on there. And this is aimed at building microservices and service applications. Uh, so again, if you take a look at the, the Micronaut webpage, uh, they have some stats around taking a standard Java application um, and bringing its boot time or its time to first request from about four and a half seconds to 0 0.08 seconds. Uh, and they do this with some really clever magic uh, by looking at the, uh, the auto wire dependencies uh, and resolving those at compile time rather than runtime. <clears throat> uh, in the Java space, uh, so the Java, the, the OpenJDK team have, uh, have also taken steps to address the Java startup time. So in May of this year, Mark Reinhold, uh, who's the, the lead Java architect, um, proposed a new JDK project called Project Laden uh, to address Java startup time. So this is, uh, will create static application binaries with faster startup and lower memory. Uh, and this will enable developers to compile code to native applications. So using AOT ahead of time um, and offering capabilities a lot like Graal. Uh, so there are some options out there, right? So Spring Boot is fantastic. Uh, I know the Spring team is also looking at ways to reduce their startup time. But if you want to go supersonic and subatomic, then you look at something like Quarkus or Micronaut. Uh, so I was taking a look to see what metrics are there out there uh, in terms of speed tests. So Quarkus versus Micronaut versus Spring Boot. Uh, I came across a few. Unfortunately, these are all done either by the Micronaut team or Quarkus or Spring. Uh, I couldn't really find one which was too um, too unbiased. Uh, this is one I found on Black Center, uh, written by uh, or put together by one of the Micronaut team. And you can see here that the compile time uh, for Micronaut is 1.48 seconds, for Spring that's 1.3 seconds. Uh, start time in production is 510 milliseconds for Micronaut versus 655 for Quarkus and Spring comes in at 1.24 seconds. Um, and then in terms of memory consumption, uh, Micronaut and Quarkus are both uh, a lot lower in memory consumption as uh, compared to a Spring application. So again, your mi mileage may vary. Um, so if you care about fast startup times, if you care about low memory, if you're running in a microservices architecture, then uh, I definitely take, recommend taking a look at Micronauts and Quarkus uh, and doing some tests of your own. Okay, um, so let's take a look at Docker. Uh, so I said as part of the agenda, we're going to take a look at Docker. So this will be a, a quick overview of Docker. Uh, Docker has been around for uh, the last few years. Um, and the idea behind Docker is that you can package your application and its dependencies into a portable lightweight container. 
Um, and really what this means is it addresses the, the issue of uh, what happens if I move environments. Uh, so I, I write some code in my development environment and I move it into UAT and I need to configure the UAT machine in such a way that it looks like production. Uh, and then I move into production and there may be subtle differences between production and UAT in my development environment. So we have this constant refrain of it works in my machine, but it doesn't work in production or it works slightly differently in production. Or it doesn't scale as well in production as it does in UAT. Uh, so Docker really aims to solve uh, this by packaging the environment and the application together. Uh, a great benefit of this is that you can then bring in container orchestration tools. So you can scale up, scale down, uh, and treat these as, uh, as containers rather than uh, separate applications. Um, so these containers are portable in the sense that you can run them locally, you can run them on-premise, you can run them on cloud-hosted infrastructure. Uh, so all the uh, cloud providers out there support Docker in some form or they support Kubernetes in some form. So AWS Elastic Container Service, ECS, uh, is fantastic if you just want to go and run some containers. Uh, some Docker terminology. Uh, so Docker daemon, so this runs on your host. This is a separate application that runs on your host and listens for Docker API requests. Um, this manages your containers and your images. So if you run Docker on the command line, Docker run or Docker uh, container, then this is talking to the Docker the daemon API. Uh, a Docker image. Uh, so this is your base for running an application. So this is the template that you use to go and construct a container. Uh, a Docker container is a running instance of a Docker image. Uh, a Docker file is a script for defining how to construct a Docker image. So it uses the, the Docker DSL uh, domain specific language, uh, specifying how to copy, what exports to expose, uh, how to start, what your various command line options are uh, in bringing up uh, an image. And then Docker Hub uh, is the online repository for storing Docker images. Um, so Docker has been around for a while, as I've said, um, and uh, there are some new ways or new tools that can be used instead of Docker. Um, Podman and Builder uh, specifically. So Podman and Builder try to address some of the issues with, uh, with the original architecture of Docker. So the fact that you need to have a Docker daemon running um, can be problematic. Uh, that introduces a single point of failure. What happens if the Docker daemon dies? It also means that uh, the Docker daemon has to run as root. Uh, so any child process which is spawned by the Docker daemon also runs as root. So Podman and Builder try to address this. Uh, you don't need to have a Docker daemon and you don't need to run as root. <clears throat> so moving on, uh, on our sample application. Uh, so this is a sample Docker file. Uh, so if you take a look at my GitHub re repo, you'll see my, my Docker file here. This is a multi-stage Docker file. Um, <clears throat> so you can see I have two from statements here. The first from statement uses the, uh, the Maven 3.5 JDK 8 uh, base image, uh, labels it as being build. Uh, it copies the source, sets the work directory to be that source directory, and then runs Maven package. So this is very basic. Uh, it will create a, a war file uh, based on the POM file. Um, from there, um, we switch into the OpenJDK 8 JRE. So if we're running in production, we don't need the full JDK. Uh, and in fact, what you'd probably want to do is you probably want to keep your, your Docker file uh, as small as possible. Um, so you want to limit the amount of stuff that goes into, the, into your uh, Docker image. Uh, Uh, so the the OpenJDK uh, JRE only contains the classes that you need to run your application. So it doesn't contain all the uh, all the JDK specific stuff to build an application. Um, if you're running uh, Java 9 onwards, you can use JLink to reduce the size of your document further by creating a customized JRE that contains only the libraries used by your application. Uh, so this is a good way of significantly reducing the footprint of your, your Docker image. Uh, I'd also recommend using at least uh, Java 10. Um, Pre-Java 10, Java didn't really play well with, uh, with containerized environments. Uh, it didn't understand the limitations imposed by the hypervisor um, or the, the, Docker, um, the Docker runtime. Um, 
but from Java 10 onwards, it starts to pay more attention to the C group settings. So they will play a bit nicer. Uh, so I certainly recommend um, Java 10 or Java 11 if you want something that's supported. Uh, so in the second half of the, the Docker file here, we are copying uh, from the, the build Docker image. Uh, we're copying the stuff that's in the target directory, uh, and we set some Java environment variables, uh, the Java options here. Uh, so we set the um, um, the remote debug port to 5005 in this case. And we're also exposing port 8080 and 5005. Um, so this allows, uh, this tells Docker to expose those ports to the outside world. Um, and then we're just calling Java jar, Java dash jar hello world dot war uh, to, to uh, spin up our Spring Boot application. Um, some common Docker commands, right? So now we've got the, the Docker file. Um, if we want to build that Docker file, we say Docker image build, and we tag it with a particular tag. Uh, this will communicate with the Docker daemon to construct an image based on that Docker file. So we now have an image stored on our local uh, Docker repository. Uh, we can take a look to see what images we have by doing Docker image ls, which shows the images stored in the local repo. Uh, if we want to instantiate an image, uh, run a container from the image, we can do Docker run Dash P here uh, maps a host port to a container port. Uh, so if you recall in our Docker file, we're exposing port 8080 and port 5005. Uh, and here we're telling Docker to, to map the, the host port uh, to that port that we've uh, exposed in the Docker file. Uh, the dash D here runs in detached mode, uh, which means that this will run in the background. So it doesn't hog all the, uh, all the forward processing. Uh, then if I want to push my my image to a Docker repository, I can say Docker push um, with my, my image and my tag and my version number. And this will push the image to a registry. So this could be Docker Hub, it could be Artifactory, it could be something running locally uh, on your network. Um, there's a fantastic site here um, and on docker.com, uh, Docker cheat sheet. Uh, so for all of your, your Docker command needs, I definitely take, uh, recommend taking a look at this. Ooh. Um, so this is great, right? So we, we now have a, a Docker image, we have a Docker container, but so far this has been very manual. We've, uh, up until now, we've needed to run uh, command line <clears throat> um, statements uh, to go and create the Docker file, uh, sorry, to, to create the, the Docker image and run the, uh, and run the container. Um, but in a Java world, what we really want to do is we want to be able to add this into our build steps. Uh, so either into our Maven build or into our Jenkins file. Uh, so there's a couple of ways that we can do this. Um, so we can link Docker and Maven together with the Spotify plugin. Uh, what this does in the background is it uses the, the Docker daemon uh, and communicates with the Docker daemon and uh, executes the Docker file. So this requires Docker to be installed. This requires it to be a Docker daemon. It requires a Docker file. Um, but it links very nicely into, uh, into the way that Maven works, into the Maven lifecycle. A Maven build will create an image, a Maven deploy will push that image to the repo. So this is very familiar, uh, very standard. Uh, the project has been marked as mature, so they are not adding new features to this. Uh, so they've decided that this is as far as they want to go with it. Um, something which is a bit newer is the Jib plugin uh, from Google. So this is part of the Google Cloud Tools. Uh, so this is, again, a Maven plugin <clears throat> uh, that lets you create a Docker image. However, this does not require Docker. Uh, this does not require a Docker file. Uh, instead, what you do is you basically uh, can construct your Docker, your Docker file inside your configuration. Uh, so it comes with some opinionated default options, uh, including what the base image is. Uh, and then you can override those. Um, you can override the from, the to, uh, any steps that you want to take. <clears throat> this also has the advantages of it separates your apps into layers. Uh, so Docker, as you may recall, is a, a union file system. And what Lib does is <clears throat> it separates your classes, resources, and dependencies into separate layers. Uh, and it will only rebuild those layers if they change. So if your resources are constants or dependencies are constants, then when you run uh, Maven with Jib, it will only re 
build the stuff that has claims to your classes in this case. Um, so this can certainly speed up your uh, your Maven build process. <clears throat> An alternative here is to use the Docker plugin in your CI pipeline. Uh, so if you're using Jenkins, for example, you can use the Docker plugin to create and push the artifact to storage. Uh, and in fact, what uh, I did at my previous company is we've wrapped the, the Docker plugin uh, with a bit of a security layer. So it gets the credentials um, from, uh, from Vault. Uh, under the covers, it will log into the Docker repo for you, manage that handshake, um, and abstract away all that uh, security concern. Okay, so that's the, the quick uh, overview of, Kubernetes, of uh, Docker. Let's take a look at Kubernetes now. Um, so we have Docker. Uh, Docker gives us a lot of advantages. Uh, so why do we need something like Kubernetes? What does Kubernetes give us that Docker doesn't give us? Uh, so from the Kubernetes website, uh, Kubernetes is an open source software for deploying, scaling, and managing containerized applications. As an orchestrator, it handles the work of scheduling containers on the cluster and manages the workloads to ensure they run as intended. Uh, so really, the, the goal of Kubernetes here is to run containers at scale. So Docker is great if you have one container, maybe a handful of containers, and you're OK with manually managing them, managing, deploying them, uh, monitoring them, scaling them up, scaling them down. Uh, but when you are in the modern microservices architecture where you have dozens, hundreds of microservices uh, that scale up and scale down, uh, you really need some kind of container orchestrator that will handle uh, heavy lifting for you. Uh, so Kubernetes, originally designed by Google, uh, has seemed to be the, the clear winner in the container orchestration wars. Uh, so there were a, a few contenders in the space. Uh, Docker, uh, Docker has Docker Swarm. Um, Mesos has Mesosphere. Uh, but Kubernetes, because it is open source, because it has such a large ecosystem behind it, uh, because it is um, scalable and resilient and all those good things, uh, is the basically the de facto standard for uh, running containers. Okay, so Kubernetes offers portability and faster, simpler deployment times. Um, Kubernetes offers scalability. Um, so portability uh, in this sense means that you can run uh, locally. You can run Kubernetes locally on your local infrastructure, on your local development machine. Uh, you can run it in the cloud. You can run it on virtuals. You can run it on bare metal. Uh, it runs anywhere. Um, scalability. So Kubernetes really solves the problem of scalability, um, meaning that you can, if you're running with enough infrastructure resources behind you, you can scale to virtually any extent. And this is uh, this is really powerful and really uh, really useful, uh, especially if you're running in the in a cloud environment. You don't have to worry too much about managing your Kubernetes infrastructure. Uh, you can auto scale, uh, roll forward and roll back um, to your heart's content. Um, high availability. So Kubernetes addresses high availability at both the application and the infrastructure level. So what this means is that Kubernetes will monitor your application. Um, you can have declarative resource definitions, which we'll take a look at in a second, um, describing what you want your application to look like running on Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes monitors the state of your application. And if there is a change, so if one of your pods goes down, for example, uh, then Kubernetes can, uh, can self-heal. Uh, so it will um, bring up a new pod if one of your pods goes down. Uh, it will scale up and scale down. Uh, and it does this under the covers. and takes a lot of that uh, heavy lifting away from you. Um, Kubernetes is open source. And it is the fastest growing open source project. Uh, and because it's been around for a number of years now, there's a vast ecosystem of, of open source tools designed specifically to work with Kubernetes. Uh, because it's open source, you don't get the lock-in of a closed or proprietary system. Um, I've seen a few articles which compare and contrast Kubernetes with something like Hadoop um, in terms of complexity, where the major difference, in my mind at least, is that um, Hadoop has unplanned complexity, and that it has grown mostly organically, um, 
and complexity adds on complexity until it becomes very difficult to understand uh, a Hadoop system. Kubernetes is different in that it has planned complexity and it has a standards on how to uh, add add-ons and extend Kubernetes. So Kubernetes has become, although it becomes a larger ecosystem, it becomes simpler to use over time and easier to use. Also, um, if you're running on a cloud provider, if you're running on something like uh, EKS or uh, Amazon or GKE for Google Cloud, then uh, the cloud providers abstract a lot of the complexity away from you. So it becomes really easy to run uh, your Kubernetes environments, to run your, your containers in a large uh, orchestrated and managed uh, manner. Um, so it's, Kubernetes is proven and battle tested. Uh, there's a huge ecosystem of developers and tools. Uh, at my last count, there was over 5,000 GitHub repositories. Uh, and this means that you won't be forging ahead into new territories without help. Uh, Kubernetes has won the Container Orchestration Awards. It is the de facto standard. Um, it is hard to go wrong by picking Kubernetes. Uh, a crash course, uh, or a quick look at Kubernetes architecture. Uh, so Kubernetes can manage rolling updates. Uh, it can adapt to additional workloads by auto scaling and can self heal in the case of a pod meltdown. We'll take a look at how that works in, in a second. Cool. Okay, so we're going to take a look at uh, the Kubernetes architecture here. Uh, so we'll take a look at the Kubernetes control plane and the Kubernetes data plane. So these are the two terms that you may hear uh, when you when you speak about Kubernetes or we do research on Kubernetes. The Kubernetes control plane really is the uh, the set of applications, the set of processes that manage uh, the resources for Kubernetes. Uh, so this is also known as the Kubernetes master, uh, and there's a number, uh, and it starts with the etcd storage. So etcd is an open source key value data store, uh, and this uh, stores configuration data of the cluster state. So we have the distributed system, a distributed data store uh, that keeps track of your configuration and the way that your Kubernetes cluster to be running. Then we have the Cube API server. Uh, this is the uh, the REST endpoint that receives requests from the worker nodes. Um, this handles uh, requests for modifications and serves as a front end to the control cluster. So if you're using uh, a tool like uh, KubeCuttle or using the Java API or one of the other client APIs, this is what you're talking to, to the API server. <clears throat> we have the Cube scheduler. Uh, so this schedules the pods on nodes on nodes based on the resource utilization and decides where the services are deployed. Uh, so this takes a look at the hardware that's available, the software that's running, uh, any policy constraints, any affinity or anti-affinity policy uh, requirements that you've specified, along with the uh, quality of service requirements. So this decides effectively where things are going to run. Uh, we have the controller manager. Uh, so the controller manager is a set of controller processes which uh, which uh, regulates the shared state of the cluster and performs routine tasks. Uh, so this includes things like replication, endpoints, namespace controllers. Uh, so if there's a change, then the controller will talk to uh, the worker nodes and in instruct them to make a change to bring the cluster back to the desired state. Uh, we have the cloud controller manager. Uh, so this is the integration with uh, the cloud provider. Uh, this comes bundled with Kubernetes. Uh, so if you're running uh, in AWS, for example, then this will interact with the, uh, the load balances uh, and AWS infrastructure uh, for running Kubernetes. Then we have add-ons. Uh, so this is how we extend the functionality of Kubernetes. Uh, there are a number of, of uh, add-ons which are developed by Kubernetes, uh, but also by uh, third parties and by vendors. So this covers things like uh, networking and networking policies. So things like uh, DNS, um, core DNS is uh, is one of the the recommended add-ons, uh, and this provides the name resolution for objects deployed in Kubernetes. Uh, there's visualization and controls. Uh, so things like dashboards and metrics. Um, there's infrastructure plugins, so the ability to run virtual machines, for example, on Kubernetes. And there's a whole set of metrics and monitoring 
Uh, so any metrics, any monitoring provider uh, that you may be familiar with probably has an add-on for running on Kubernetes. Uh, taking a look at the Kubernetes data plane then. Uh, so this is the set of Kubernetes worker loops. Um, there are two processes that run on a worker. The first is kubelet. This is the primary node agent that runs on each node. And this communicates with the master. And this makes sure that the containers are running and healthy. And we have kube proxy. Uh, so this is the Kubernetes network proxy. And this provides the Kubernetes networking services. So uh, let's take a look at how this all hangs together. So we have the control plane talking to the data plane. And then we have um, a command line utility that can interact with the control plane talking to the API uh, server. Um, the, the one that's typically used is kubectl. Uh, and if you want to um, define a new resource and instantiate it inside Kubernetes, you'd use a command like kubectl apply and give it a, a YAML definition, which will define your, your resources that you want Kubernetes to go and deploy for you. And so a typical flow here for a Java developer would be that you'd create your Docker image, you'd update your Kubernetes manifest file, and then you'd use kubectl to uh, deploy the resources out. <clears throat> okay, let's take a look at um, some Kubernetes concepts here. Uh, so we spoke about the data plane, we, talk, we spoke about, about the control plane. Um, let's take a look at some of the, the core concepts of Kubernetes and so a container. Uh, so a container is typically your, your Docker container, uh, but this could also be a variety of other uh, container types. Uh, so Kubernetes uh, supports container D, cryo, and any implementation of the Kubernetes container runtime interface. Um, pods. So pod is the basic building block for Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes doesn't deal in raw containers per such, per se. Um, pods are uh, typically one container, um, but you can also run multiple related containers together. Uh, a typical use case for this would be something like Istio, um, where you can run a sidecar, a container alongside your container that provides some services. So this could be logging services, it could be metrics, it could be network uh, services. Um, the pod shares the network and storage and a specification for how to run the containers with all the containers that are inside that pod. Uh, so because it's local network and local storage, uh, that means that the communication between the, the containers running in the pod is over the, the local host. So it's very quick. It doesn't require uh, any network access. Um, deployments. So typically, you won't deal with either containers or pods. Uh, typically, you deal with a deployment. And a deployment is a uh, describes the desired state of your containers and your pods. Uh, so this is a, a YAML file or a specification that uh, describes uh, the configuration of your containers. This can uh, support things like the increasing number of replicas, running out new states, running back, scaling up, pausing, and cleaning up uh, obsolete sets. Uh, so there's a, a few workload API objects uh, that Kubernetes supports here. The first is a replica set. Uh, so this is a stable set of, rep of uh, replica pods. Um, and this is instruction to Kubernetes to maintain the stable set at any given moment. So you'd say, for this container, I want to have three replicas running, please. Um, you can have a stateful set. So this is a, an API object which is used to manage stateful applications. So if you have um, pods which have uh, some relationship between them, so say you have a gateway and you have some services behind that, you want to have the gateway running first. Uh, so a stateful set will manage the deployment and scaling of a set of pods and provides guarantees about the ordering and their uniqueness. So this is useful if you have, um, if you want to have stable unique network identifiers, if you want to have stable persistent storage, if you want to have an ordered graceful deployment and scaling mechanism, or if you want to do an ordered automating running update. Uh, then we have daemon set. So daemon set ensures that all or some nodes that you specify run a copy of a pod. 
the node in this case is a worker node. So as the nodes are added to the cluster, the pods are added to them. Uh, as the nodes are removed, those pods are garbage collected and deleting an entire daemon set will clean up the pods that are created. Uh, so daemon set is useful if you're running, for example, a cluster storage daemon on every node. If you want to run a logs connecting daemon on every node, if you want to run a node monitoring daemon on every node. So not specifically for a, a pod, but something that is you want to run once on every host. <clears throat> um, service. Uh, so Kubernetes service is an abstraction layer which defines a logical set of pods and enables external traffic exposure load balancing and service discovery for those pods. Uh, and the set of the pods is usually determined by a selector. Uh, so service in this case is a way of grouping together uh, a number of pods. Um, in a microservices uh, application and a Kubernetes application, you will have, we potentially have um, containers starting up and shutting down. Uh, you won't know at any given moment what the IP address for a particular uh, container is. Um, instead, what you need is an abstraction that can help you um, load balance uh, across those services. So for example, consider that we have a, an image processing background backend, which is running with three replicas. Uh, those replicas are fungible. So the, the front ends don't really care about which backend they use. Uh, they are just mirror, mirror images of each other. So while the, the actual pods that compose the backend may change, the front end clients don't need to be aware of that. And they don't need to keep track of the set of backends themselves. And the service is the abstraction that enables this decoupling. Um, so service comes in various service types. Uh, so there's the cluster IP. So this exposes the service on an internal IP in the cluster. And this means that uh, services are only reachable from within the cluster. And this is the default for, uh, for services inside Kubernetes. <clears throat> if you want to expose your services outside your Kubernetes cluster, you have a couple of options. The first option is node port. Uh, so this will expose this, the service on the same port for each selected node in the cluster using uh, network address translation tables. And this makes your service accessible from outside the cluster using your node IP and your node port. So if you want to directly access your service, this is a way of doing it. Uh, if you're running in the cloud uh, and you have, and your cloud supports, um, supports load balancers, which I think they all do, then you can specify your service type to be load balancer. And this will uh, use the cloud controller to go and configure a load balancer uh, and expose the endpoint to the load balancer. Um, this assigns the fixed it's external IP to the load balancer, and the load balancer will then load balance across your uh, your nodes which belong to your service. Um, there is a, a fourth type here. So there's external name. Uh, this requires uh, a fairly recent version of the kubeDNS add-on. Um, and this exposes your service using an arbitrary name. So this returns a C name record with a name uh, and exposes it using a name rather than an IP address. Uh, so let's take a look at a Kubernetes resource manifest. So we spoke about deployments, we spoke about services. Um, this is the YAML file that defines a deployment. So we can see the kind at the top here, the second line is deployment. Uh, we have some metadata, we have the spec, which says we want to have one replica. Um, we have a template definition, which has the labels saying that all of the containers that run in this um, in this deployment will have the label of hello. Um, then we have the, the, the spec, uh, the container spec, uh, where we're saying that the image that we want to use is runesmith slash hello, uh, which is the name of my image. Uh, it uses the image pull policy that we will pull the image if it's not present already. Um, and then it will expose the ports, the container port 8080 uh, as HTTP and expose the container port 5005 uh, as debug. So using this, I can use the kubectl uh, apply minus F uh, and Kubernetes will go and create the deployment for me. So it'll create one container uh, with a label of hello.
um, if I then want to expose this uh, via a service, so either as a load balancer or, or a, a node port, um, I can use a service uh, definition. So this is a service kind. Uh, I've got the selector here using app hello. Uh, so th this is going to take a look at all of those containers, all those pods rather, uh, which have the label of hello uh, and bring them into the service. Um, I'm exposing the HTTP um, port uh, and I'm mapping it to port 8018. And I'm sending it here to use the type load balancer. So this will talk to the cloud controller and set up a load balancer uh, if my cloud infrastructure supports it. <clears throat> That's using the, the kubectl command line. Now there is, there are uh, clients in various languages for Kubernetes. Uh, so the, the Kubernetes API server is a REST endpoint. Um, and this means that um, it's language agnostic. So you can uh, easily include the Java client um, by going to github.com slash Kubernetes dash client slash Java, um, taking a look at the documentation there or adding this Maven dependency um, block into your POM file. Um, if you have that, then you can programmatically interact with your, your API server. We have a little bit of code here that shows how to uh, construct a new pod uh, using a Fluent API. This creates new metadata, creates new spec, adds containers. Uh, in this case, I'm running the Nginx container uh, and I'm calling build at the end and then calling out the API to create a namespace pod uh, with some, um, some parameters here. So this will uh, this is a programmatic way of interacting with uh, the Kubernetes API. Um, some common commands. <clears throat> um, so kubectl config get context. Uh, so kubectl lets you talk to multiple uh, Kubernetes clusters, um, which, they, which it calls context. So you could have a context running on a cloud provider. You could have a context running locally. You could have multiple contexts running locally. Uh, kubectl config lets you see what contexts are running, which one you're connected to, uh, and change uh, to talk to different contexts. Uh, we've already seen the apply, uh, so you can apply um, your manifests, your resources. Um, you can also combine your resources together into a single um, resource file. So in my example, I had a separate um, definition for service and a separate definition for deployment. I can combine those together into one file. Um, I can call kubectl to get information about the services, the pods, and the deployments that are running. I can also call kubectl to report on the logs, <clears throat> to display the logs from a given uh, pod. Um, I can use kubectl to roll out. Um, so check the history of deployments. I can roll back to previous uh, deployments, and I can do a rolling restart. I can also use kubectl to autoscale. So I can autoscale my deployment um, with a min of two and a max of 10 here, and I can specify the autoscaling parameters. So for example, I could say, when CPU usage reaches 80%, then scale out. Um, there's a very handy reference here. Um, if you go to Kubernetes IO, there's a kubectl cheat sheet, which has a lot more uh, of the common commands, uh, including how to uh, remove resources once they've been deployed. Um, something that I found very useful is having a web UI that lets you visualize what's happening in your uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so dashboard is a web-based Kubernetes user interface. Uh, this actually comes standard um, with some of the Kubernetes tools. Um, it lets you use the web UI to deploy your applications to uh, Kubernetes, to troubleshoot, manage your resources. Like you can see an overview of applications uh, you can scale up, you can scale down, you can restart, you can deploy new applications, uh, and this provides a new, uh, a, a useful uh, visual uh, mechanism of, of seeing what's happening in your Kubernetes cluster. Right, um, so how do we get Kubernetes running locally? There are a few options here. Um, Minikube is very popular. Uh, so Minikube requires a hypervisor to be running um, so if you're running on Mac OS, um, you can use something like Hyper-V or VirtualBox. Um, 
if you're running macOS like I am, it's very simple to install Minikube. You just say brew install Minikube. <clears throat> um, then you can start your cluster with the Minikube start, and this will create a single node uh, Kubernetes cluster on your local machine. Uh, you can then interact with your uh, with your cluster, you can get Minikube to download the kubectl command line, and Minikube comes bundled with dashboard, so you don't need to go and install it yourself. Uh, so this is very useful, a uh, very easy way of getting uh, Kubernetes up and running locally. Uh, another example, another <clears throat> another option is to use the Docker desktop. So if you're running uh, the Docker desktop on Windows or on Mac OS, uh, then one of the new features in the newer versions is the ability to enable Kubernetes. So you just go into the preferences, uh, you say enable Kubernetes, and this will go and create very much like Minikube. It will go and create a single node Kubernetes instance for you running on your local machine. <clears throat> um, another thing which I highly recommend is Catacoda. Uh, so this is an interactive browser-based scenarios. Um, they have a number of scenarios aimed at getting up and running with Kubernetes, uh, starting with launching a single node cluster. This is running on the on their hosted infrastructure. So it's not running anything locally on your machine. Um, so you don't need to worry about resources and you don't need to worry about um, blowing up your machine. Um, it shows you how to do a multi-node cluster using Kube ADM. Uh, you can deploy containers, you can deploy containers with kubectl, with YAML. And it walks you through uh, a lot of scenarios of varying complexity, starting from the very beginner stuff to the more advanced use cases. Um, it doesn't just cover Kubernetes. Um, Catacoda is fantastic for all sorts of modern uh, applications. If you want to understand more about OpenShift, uh, Docker, Kubernetes, um, any new technology, they have a, a lot of um, tutorials and scenarios which are interactive. Uh, which will walk you through how to set things up and how to get it up and running. So very highly recommended there. Um, let's talk a little bit about Helm. So um, Kubernetes is great, um, but now I want to uh, share my Kubernetes applications with the world. And this is where Helm comes in useful. So Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. Um, and this is very similar to things like uh, apt, yum, homebrew. Um, it's uh, a template engine, uh, which manages a collection of YAML templates, which are organized into directories, which is very similar to a deb or RPM files. <clears throat> uh, so this uh, allows your Kubernetes config files to be templatized. Um, and this is then rendered to create the corresponding Kubernetes resource files. So this allows us to use um, things like common values like ports and replica counts in a central location. Um, this reduces complexity, improves productivity, and allows your charts to be easily customized for your Kubernetes environment. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to distribute your, your Kubernetes application into the world, then Helm charts are a really good way of doing this. Um, it also um, makes interacting with uh, Kubernetes a lot easier. So you can use your Helm chart. You can say Helm install, uh, and that will go and run your resources and create your um, your service, your pod, your deployment, and then Helm uninstall, and that will go and shut down your services, deployments, and pods. Um, <clears throat> deployment pipelines. And so um, as we've seen, it can be quite cumbersome to work with uh, Kubernetes. There's lots of moving pieces. Uh, every time you make a change, you may have to go and uh, redeploy. So rerun your kubectl commands, uh, redeploy your resources, restart your services. Um, so Google have released a, a tool called Scaffold um, that aims at addressing some of these issues. Uh, so this is really looking at continuous development for your Kubernetes applications. Um, so it watches your code. If there's a code change, uh, it will continuously deploy to your local or to your remote Kubernetes cluster. So it will take a look at your uh, at your Kubernetes configuration, at your Docker file. Uh, if there's a change to your code, 
it will rerun the Docker file, recreate the image, and redeploy it into your Kubernetes cluster. Um, if you're uh, if you're looking at something which is a bit more production ready, uh, then Spinnaker uh, is a very useful tool here. Uh, so Spinnaker is an open source, multi-cloud, continuous delivery platform, um, whereas Scaffold is more aimed at development. Uh, Spinnaker is more aimed at uh, deployment into production. Um, so this lets you set up pipelines, um, lets you do A-B testing, canary releases, uh, in a, an automated and pipeline fashion. Um, another alternative or various other alternatives would be used uh, things like Ansible or Salt or Chef or Puppet or Octopus or any of the other uh, CI CD um, configuration as code tools out there. Um, I'm going to skip over Istio a little bit, um, but Istio is uh, is really is the next level. So once you've once you've mastered Kubernetes and you need to think about how do I manage traffic, how do I secure my communications, and how do I um, introduce observability, do tracing and monitoring and logging, uh, then Istio and other service messages are uh, a good place to look. Um, I have a, a number of resources here. Uh, so again, this was intended as being a kind of like a a very quick overview of of Docker, uh, of some of the tooling around Kubernetes. Um, but there's a lot more to dig into here. Uh, so um, there's links to my GitHub repo over here, where I have a Spring Boot sample using Docker, Kubernetes, Helm, and Scaffold. Uh, there's links to the uh, the CAT code of Kubernetes Playground, the Java client library, the Docker cheat sheet, the Istio project. Uh, there's links to the Helm documentation, there's links to Scaffold, there's links to Project Laden. Uh, I'd also highly recommend the Kelsey Hightower Kubernetes the Hard Way uh, in-depth guide to setting up and running a Kubernetes cluster. Um, I'd also strongly recommend the Kubernetes for Java developers uh, course on LinkedIn Learning from Aaron Gupta. Uh, and there's a great introduction in how to set up a CD pipeline with Kubernetes and Jenkins, which is uses Go, um, but the uh, the concepts are transferable into, into Java here. Okay, um, so I appreciate that was probably a lot of information. Um, I was keeping an eye on the time trying to get this down to under an hour. Uh, so thank you everyone for your patience. Um, I'm gonna see if I can bring up... Um... So Rob, we do have a couple of questions. So sure. one was from earlier on in your presentation, you mentioned uh, that it's good to go with Java 10 or plus when you're dealing yes. with containers. And there's a question from Jonathan Harris around, could you elaborate on Java 8 problems in containers? Um, sure. Uh, so really the issue with, with Java before Java 10 is that it wasn't, con it wasn't hypervisor aware. Um, so it didn't pay particular attention to uh, C groups limitations, right? So you could specify, for example, that you want to have uh, a gig of memory, um, and Java would attempt to get the gig of memory, uh, but your C groups or your underlying hypervisor might limit that to you know, eight megs of memory. Uh, and Java didn't really play very well with that. So it wasn't container aware in that sense. Uh, Java 10 did a lot of work around this. So it's a lot more friendly in running containers. Great. Um, are there any other questions from anyone else? We are a bit short on time. In a nutshell, uh, I have a question, sorry. In a nutshell, how do you see uh, like um, um, uh, Docker, uh, uh, we, we have like a um, uh, Docker swarm uh, when compared to Kubernetes because like um, quite new, I'm in a transition <coughs> period from Docker Swarm to Kubernetes. So what do you see is the main difference here? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'd say probably uh, the the adoption, right? If you want to, uh, if you're looking at running Docker at scale on a cloud environment, then the default is Kubernetes. Um, now Docker Swarm predates, as far as I'm aware, predates Kubernetes, but um, it's, it has a lot of similar features to Kubernetes, 
um, but it doesn't have as wide adoption as Kubernetes does. All right, thank you. Great, and then I guess um, there's a statement from Matt uh, who talks about the three levels of auto scaling. K8 has uh, horizontal and vertical, and the cloud provider will have a separate auto scaling mechanism for actual nodes. I think that's part of the conversation, maybe. Mm -hmm. Are there any final conversations? Uh, sorry, final questions from anyone? Okay, excellent. Thanks a lot, Rob. Um, there will be a recording of this uh, sent out uh, later on uh, once it's been processed. Uh, and thanks for everyone for joining. And thanks again, Rob. Great. Thank you, everyone.